All right. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is having a wonderful Friday so far. And uh, with me today is Dr. Amy Day. Um, so Amy, Dr. Amy has been at the forefront of the natural woman's health movement since 2004 after receiving the fourth ND license in the state of California. Very impressive. <laughs> and so while she was in naturopathic medical school, um, struggles with her own woman's health issues fueled by Dr. Amy's passion. And so pretty much in short, Dr. Amy's a hormone expert. So that's why we're going to chat about adrenal health, perimenopause, and um, we'll also be answering some of your questions later on. Um, so, uh, and she's the founder and CEO of the Women's Vitality Center. And uh, again, it helps, um, specializes in helping busy professional women struggling with perimenopause to balance their hormones. And again, a big part of that is also balancing their adrenals, which we'll get into. So welcome, Dr. Amy. Thanks for uh, getting together for this interview. Absolutely. It's an honor to be here. And it's really been fun to connect with you and get to know you and all the amazing thyroid work that you do. And it's it's so important how all these different hormones interconnect with each other. And I'm excited to, to have a conversation about it today. So thank you for having me. Yeah, no, you are very welcome. Excited as well. And uh, so why don't we just jump into the adrenals? We're, we're going to, again, talk about adrenals and perimenopause and um, and I think uh, Dr. Amy might have froze there. Dr. Amy, are you still with us here? I'm still here. In my oh, okay, okay, okay. As long as we could hear you, so your okay. yeah, your screen's freezing a little bit, but as long as as long as okay, <laughs> but okay. No, no no worries. Uh, um, so we're gonna start talking about adrenal health, and uh, then we'll make our way into perimenopause. So, can you uh tell? The, the viewers, why the adrenals are so important for our health? Yeah, so adrenals, but many people have heard of them and many people have not. So just to, to take a little step back of like, what are the adrenals? What are we even talking about? Um, the adrenals are, are the, a part of our endocrine or hormone system that um, they have many functions, but one of their, the main functions is to help us to respond to stress. So they, they're little glands that sit on top of your kidneys in the middle of your back. They're like little hats that sit on top of your kidneys and they produce cortisol, which is your main stress response hormone. Um, they also produce a host of other hormones, but that's one of the, the big roles for the adrenals. So this all has to do with how do you respond to stress? Like stress is going to happen in life. So how, how do you, how, how is that working for you physiologically to be able to respond to that stress? All right. All right. Good deal. Thank you for that explanation. And why do so many people have adrenal problems? Uh, at least I see a lot of adrenal problems in my practice and, uh, and I assume you, you do as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, it's, and, and it's interesting what we consider to be an adrenal problem, like in conventional medicine, there's this, this black and white picture of like, everything's completely fine, or you're in a completely diseased state of the adrenals. And what we see in fun more functional medicine, natural medicine kind of practices is everything in between where the adrenal glands are just having, um, having dysfunction related to the chronic stress that we tend to accumulate in our lives. So whether it's, it's big short-term stresses that are going on or all the little things that add up over time and are going on for a longer time, um, that, uh, that accumulation of stress can make it so that the adrenal system is just not able to, to completely respond as adequately. So, and the, the one other thing to mention about what the adrenals do for us, there's a stress response in the sense of like, in the moment, there's like a stressful thing going on and you, you, you know, you, you get your, your blood sugar up and your heart pumping and your eyes dilate and your muscles stronger. And you're like, you know, flooding your system with blood sugar to be able to, to fight or flight. And um, so there's that acute stress response. And then there's also a role, a really important role that the adrenals do for us, which is regulating the circadian rhythm or our 24 hour clock. So your court, your uh, adrenals produce cortisol for you first thing in the morning. That's part of your get up and go. 
And then those higher levels taper off over the course of the day and drop at nighttime. So regulating that night day rhythm is another really important thing that the adrenals do. Um, so when we're when we're in chronic stress situations, when our um, schedules are are irregular, when we when we have an acute you know issue of some kind going on, either emotional or physical, um, any of those things can contribute to the the challenge of the adrenal glands. Okay, great. And it's important what you just said also, not just emotional stressors, physical stressors, and um, you know, lack of sleep also has a huge impact on adrenal health. And, um, and you also mentioned, so the difference between acute stressors and chronic stressors. So when someone is in a, you know, acute stress, just uh, that, I mean, the, the adrenals, do a pretty good job of adapting to acute stress. So you're more concerned about the chronic stress, correct? Yeah, either the, the buildup of the chronic stress or the long-term impacts of the acute stresses when they when they happen. Like some people will be, you know, they've never been well since some big thing happened in their life or or to the you know to their bodies or something and then it's the the long-term consequences coming from that because that resiliency wasn't there to be able to bounce back um or yeah so that's how acute stress can turn into a long-term issue or the chronic stress that's the the everyday everyday grind of all the demands in our lives and the get up and go and the deadlines and the, the world that we live in and the issues that different people face um, that are just constant drains on our system. Yeah. And of course, it's only been increased over the last year for a lot of people, for most people with everything going on. So, but, um, but even before, you know, last year, you know, there's always stressors, there's always going to be stressors and, you know, that's why we want to try to do everything to uh, improve our stress handling skills. You know, what well, we could talk more about that. But I want to talk about, of course, thyroid and adrenals. So what impact do, what, as far as stress, so stress affects adrenals. So the impact that chronic stress, I guess you could say, has on thyroid. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll make a couple comments, but I'd love to hear from you. So sure. <laughs> this connection, right? So often we see... Uh, when people are having thyroid problems, that there's an adrenal aspect to that also, or it could be vice versa. So um, I, I see it a lot in practice, and we know that um, that in order for the thyroid to function optimally, that that the adrenals need to be functioning optimally as well. Um, but I, I turn it to you. I would love to hear your perspective, actually, on on where, like how that uh, relationship is between the adrenals and the thyroid. Sure. I mean, there's a few different ways. So you know, especially when someone is dealing with uh, chronic stress and high cortisol, uh, it's important, um, you know, T4, as you know, converts into T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. And most of this takes place in the liver. Some of it takes place in the gut, I think approximately 60% in the liver, 20% in the gut. So those, um, those could have an, effect, an impact on, um, on adrenal health, but, um, or I'm sorry, on, on thyroid health, but um, also when someone has stress out adrenals, that could affect conversion of T4 to T3 when they have, you know, especially high cortisol levels. So that's, you know, that's one way when someone see, when we see, you know, it could be T4, low T4 and low T3, but a lot of times we'll see, or I'll see some, you know, T4, normal T4, low T3. And again, that might be related to problems with the liver, might be pro related to problems with the gut. So it's not only adrenals, but adrenals can play a big role. And then chronic stress, for those with Graves and Hashimoto's, chronic stress causes dysregulation of the immune system, uh, pro-inflammatory state. So that could also at least be a factor, a contributing factor, potentially a trigger of thyroid autoimmunity. And um, then another way is there's what's called secretory IgA, which lines the mucosa surfaces of the body. And chronic stress will typically decrease secretory IgA, and that's a protective barrier. So when you have a decrease in secretory IgA, it can make you more susceptible to, let's say, infections, uh, for example. Um, so yeah, those are three different ways in which uh, problems with adrenals can, can affect thyroid. One, directly affecting thyroid. Two other ways affecting uh, more the immune system. And um, But yeah, so... Uh, 
and yeah, definitely see a lot of that in my practice as well. And uh, you know, well, and I mean, how about sex hormones? Because again, we're going to talk about perimenopause. So do you want to? And again, I could also elaborate on that. But if you want to talk a little bit about impact of stress and adrenals on sex hormones. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 I, I love the points that you just made too. It just speaks to the whether we're thinking of it as an adrenal or thinking of it as a thyroid or thinking of it as a sex hormone imbalance, whatever, wherever it's showing up like that, just recognizing that that the stresses are showing up in our bodies in all these ways. I feel like in, in our society, it's become so normal to normalize to just be experiencing stress all the time. And, and that, that idea of really recognizing it's, it's having a huge impact and the idea of how, you know, stress is, is basically as detrimental to our physiology as smoking is, which we, you know, pr pretty broadly now know, like most people don't want to be doing that to their bodies. So, um, and yet we, we have a lot of stress in our lives and a lot, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So it can be challenging, but anyway, thank you for pointing out those different aspects of how the, um, Adrenals are impacting the thyroid for sure. The impact on the sex hormones. So the adrenal glands I mentioned earlier, they produce cortisol. They also produce a host of other hormones. They are actually capable of producing estrogen and progesterone too. So part of what happens in perimenopause is that your ovarian production of estrogen and progesterone start to change. Um, First, we, uh, women tend to start producing less progesterone and still have the estrogen on board, but then later through the perimenopausal transition and into menopause, then having low levels of both progesterone and estrogen is, is the typical um, course for that. And the adrenals are able to produce some estrogen and progesterone, which can help to fill in the gaps, if you will. So like, so uh, stabilizing during perimenopause, when the hormones are just on this roller coaster of crazy ups and downs, that can be stabilized out. And then postmenopausally, that the um, adrenals can contribute to the hormones that are missing at that time. So. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, one thing also I'll mention is that you know, there, I don't want to get um, too much into the hormone pathway, but, you know, it, 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 it all starts with cholesterol. So, you, of course, you need healthy cholesterol. So if you're taking something like a statin, that could also affect um, sex hormones. But the um, and then you get cholesterol turns into pregnenolone and then it goes separates into two different pathways. And the body will always prioritize the production of cortisol at the expense of the sex hormone. So, which, which makes sense. If you're in a stressed out situation, you know, you're probably not going to want to have sex. You're going to want to, you know, like, uh, you know, like an example of given, like, you know, like, you know, going back to the caveman, you know, years where if a caveman was being chased by a lion, or I, I guess that could happen today too, maybe, but ch chased by a bear or something, you know, you're not going to, you know, want to have sex while being chased by the bear. You're going to think about just the fight or flight reaction. So the body's going to always prioritize cortisol. But the problem, again, as we're discussing, you know, everybody's in a chronic state of stress. And so they'll always be pumping out cortisol. That's going to sacrifice the sex hormones. DHEA is going to be on the lower side, testosterone, you know, the, the estrogens. And again, you might not see that pattern, like you might not see all the hormones low, it, it takes time for that to happen. And we'll, you know, talk about the testing as well, especially more, more so with the adrenals. But um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, why don't we jump into perimenopause and, and talk about, or why don't we talk about, maybe talk about testing a little bit and kind of like lead into the, because you do recommend testing adrenals, is that correct? I, I do. So this is, it's interesting. A lot of, a lot of women will start experiencing some changes, right? They're, they're in their late thirties or, you know, going through their forties for some women, it's not until their late forties that it's really starting to kick in anyway, but just what it usually, what perimenopause usually starts with is, 
is is subtle or or some, sometimes not so subtle, but sometimes we're like not sure is this perimenopause? Like what's going on? And like I'm a little hotter than usual, or my period came later. I'm like snapping at people more often, and like no, it's just because the people are really annoying now, <laughs> or maybe my hormones are changing. Um, so this all the all the different changes that can happen, and we start start putting the pieces together like something's going on here. And a lot of women are, are uh, come, you know, coming with the question of like, I want to get my hormones tested. I want to see what's going on. And something that I think is important to know is that there's, there's, there can absolutely be value in testing the ovarian mm -hmm. hormones, the estrogen, progesterone, the testosterone, like actually measuring and looking at those. But very often the estrogen and progesterone are shifting and changing day by day and even from one cycle to the next and timing that testing and really interpreting it is can be a little tricky and you know you can definitely get useful information from it but most conventional doctors when i've had patients say they went to their doctor they asked for testing the doctor says we don't do any testing um so it's it's i think it's important to know that there there can be useful testing to be done um, but the first layer of testing that i always recommend is, is a general screening blood test and mm -hmm. an adrenal test. So in, in the general screening blood test, and that this is, you know, it's gonna be, you mentioned a minute ago, like the, the sex hormones and um, adrenal hormones are made from cholesterol. Like, are, are you getting enough good fats in? Do you have cholesterol? We, you know, we've been told for heart health reasons, you don't want high cholesterol. You wanna keep your cholesterol really low, but you actually need enough and you wanna be getting in those good fats and having that cholesterol as the um, precursor to your hormones. So screening things like heart, you know, cholesterol, heart health markers, your blood sugar regulation markers, um, nutrient levels, you know, things that might explain if you're feeling kind of tired, if you're feeling, you know, if there's things going on in your body that you want to check in on. Um, and thyroid, of course, really important yeah. to do a really thorough screening. Even if you've had thyroid testing done before, uh, this is a time in life where because everything's up and moving and changing a little bit, this is a time where it can show up, even if you've been normal in the past. Um, so a really good thorough thyroid screen, which I, I can leave you to <laughs> chat about. Um, and then the, the adrenal testing is in looking at your cortisol over the course of the day to see how your how your production is doing for the um, for the adrenal glands, the cortisol and the DHEA um, can be really important to look at. And that's that you're going to get more useful information out of as a first layer um, and, and usually addressing those, the, the uh, nutrition and the thyroid and the adrenal and the blood sugar regulation that will create a foundation of stability that helps to, to decrease the wildness of the up and down roller coaster that perimenopause can be. All right. No, thank you for, for that. And so with regards to adrenal testing, uh, then, and, and we chatted a little bit before, you know, this interview. So I know you, just like I do, you do saliva testing and uh, you also do some Dutch testing. We're not going to get too much into the, you know, dried urine testing because it is a pretty in-depth test. But so the reason, well, I was, I guess I could ask you, I, I, we both know the answer to this, but uh, of course we're kind of testing the viewers, you know, so why, why would you want to test saliva, t do a saliva test or dried urine test and not just test morning cortisol in the blood or, or do, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, leave it good, at that. Good, good question. So that's, and that, so in, in, um, let's see. So because of the fact that the adrenals are regulating your circadian rhythm and that 24 hour clock, your cortisol changes throughout the day. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot like um, when we're testing estrogen and progesterone in a woman having a cycle, it matters what day of the cycle we test on because the levels are changing. So a level on one day look, might look low, another day might be high, but it's the same number. So that's, you have to know what you're looking at. Um, and the way that cortisol has its cycle in a day, we produce more cortisol first thing in the morning, and then it tapers off as you go through the day and drops at nighttime to help you wind down and go to sleep. So you need to look at that pattern by looking at only one data point. You're really not getting a full picture of how the adrenals are responding over the course of the day. Um, so, and then a, a blood level is a very short term 
Um, that's just, you know, the amount that's circulating right in that instant. Um, and for some people, getting their blood drawn is a stressful experience. Yeah, I was um, going to bring that, that up. So yeah, that's, that I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you did that. Yeah. <laughs> and we, in order to get a blood draw, unless you happen to be, you know, have a, have a partner or someone in your home who's a venipuncturist, usually you have to be up and get ready and get out the door and go yeah. somewhere to get your blood drawn. And your cortisol peaks about 15 to 20 minutes after you first wake up. So getting that awakening response and getting a sense of what's happening right away um, in the morning is is more indicative of of truly your cortisol level. So there's several factors that that make a home test kit. Um, and there's pros and cons to saliva or a dried urine testing. Um, but but they both of those give you the opportunity to test at home and look at four different points at least over the course of a day and map out that pattern that gives you an idea. It's not just, am I high, am I low? It's what's the pattern over the day is what really is what we're looking for. Yep. Oh, Did right I hit up. all your points? Did you have any yeah, other? <laughs> no, yeah, for the most part, yeah. I think you you hit it all with regards to, you know, especially cortisol and, uh, you know, as, you mentioned there's no perfect test and the a big potential drawback of the blood test is like you said a lot of people well, even if they're not stressed out like going to the lab just getting the you know the blood draw itself for some people you know it, it, like it, it, they might not perceive it as being stressful and I, I know it does come down to the perception when it comes to stress a lot of times but but that's also important to mention even when doing a home test like saliva or dried urine if you collect the same, like you want to collect it on a, a regular day, you know, on a, a, ideally, I mean, a lot of people will do it on a weekend just because it's hard to do dur like during a work day. But I guess the point is if you have an abnormally stressful day, so if you're collecting it and, you know, you have a argument with your spouse be before the collection or have a headache. Um, I once had, I, I mean, I've had a lot of people with different patterns, but I remember one specific situation where someone was doing a, they did their saliva test and I saw that it was elevated around lunchtime and they were mentioning that they were studying for an exam and they were stressed out because of the exam. So, so again, even the, the home tests aren't perfect. And that's why if I see some crazy findings, I usually ask the person, was this, a, did anything unusual happen that day? So, uh, but yeah, the, the same exact reason I've been doing saliva testing, you know, all these years and more recently on some people dried urine testing, um, you know, I think either saliva, if you're just focusing on adrenals, I think saliva testing or dried urine testing, you know, is fine to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, just for that circadian rhythm. So you could see it throughout the day, you know, first thing in the morning and then last thing at, at the end of the day and then the couple of in between. So, so yeah, thanks for that explanation. Yeah. And Should we talk a little bit about the patterns and kind of what that can mean or? Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea because also, you know, some people wonder why test the adrenals, like if chronic stress, you know, it's, I mean, we'll get into the patterns and that's a big reason why, but yeah, if everybody's stressed out, why don't we just assume people have adrenal problems and not do the testing and it comes down because different people have different patterns. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you take over and talk yeah. about some of the different patterns. So. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 a, it's good. It's interesting that you, you put it that way because you're right. There is this idea that like, I know I'm stressed. <laughs> I know that's part of it. So why why does it matter? What's going to change based on the numbers or the patterns? And to some extent, it's a, it's a valid point to make. And if you're really you know watching your budget or really trying to just take the most streamlined approach to what you're doing for your health, if you're willing to make some lifestyle changes, and you know you don't necessarily need the the, that data to prove it to you. Um, it's, you know, a lot of the things that, um, that help to restore adrenal function are safe and appropriate to do regardless of exactly what your numbers or your pattern really is. So there, you know, there's some, some, uh, truth in there, but you can get more specific if you know exactly what's going on in your own physiology and you can put your, your effort you know, more focused on the things that your body particularly needs if you if you know better where you're starting from. And the truth of the matter is that for most people actually seeing it on paper is just 
so or on the screen if you're looking at electronic results um, is just so it's validating for one thing you know your other doctors have probably told you everything's fine there's no reason for you to be so exhausted you're it's all in your head or whatever and so to you know that validation of like yes there is a real thing going on with you here um, and it gives you a baseline that you can compare to in the future too you can see okay i've made it this far in my progress at three months or six months and and you know how to monitor that too so um, so there's, there's three basic patterns that I, I usually tend to find. And of course, every individual is unique and there can be nuances in this, but there's the people who just like run high, like the normal slope might be like this. And they're just like, boom, across the, the top of the chart like this. And this is someone who's like, uh, probably experiencing anxiety, you know, wakes up in the morning, like early on, ready to go, like jumps into everything, like go, 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 like, you know, mile a minute, ends the day, still just, just powered through um, and all that. So some people just run high. Some people run low. This is like so hard to get up and get going in the morning that maybe the alarm goes off and you like snooze it six times and you're dragging yourself out of bed and like try to pry your eyes open and maybe feeling like you have to have caffeine or sugar to get, you know, get your engine running and get yourself going as you go through the day, dragging, foggy thinking, hard to do your work. You know, you get to the end of the day and you're just like, ugh, it's so, you know, just been like bottomed out all day long. And then the other third pattern that's probably um, the, the most common that I see because it's kind of the in-between point is a reverse curve where you're tired in the morning, you're trying to get going, you're, it's, it takes a little while to get it all going and all, all of that. You're tired through the day, a little foggy, maybe some ups and downs if you've like, got, got something exciting you're working on. And then you get to the end of the night and the, the classic description of this is wired tired, where you get to the end of the night and you're you're wishing you could sleep, but boing, everything turns on and your eyes are wide open and you're so productive and you're getting your stuff done and you're like, you know, you're doing all, all these things. You finally have this like burst of energy in this time, maybe late at night, and then you end up going to bed late and then the next morning you're tired and the whole pattern keep, keeps repeating too. So the reverse curve and and usually the order of things over a person's lifetime is that we we can run high 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 and go like that for a while and then the system starts dysregulating and flips and then ultimately like burnout is is that that low just like can't even mount that that response anymore um, so that's what we're looking for on the test results is where where are you in at different times of the day to show um, what, where you need to focus the most on to help correct the curve and help support the adrenals. All right. All right. Wonderful. Um, also want to let, uh, viewers know, just feel free to, we'll be getting to questions soon. So if you have questions for Dr. Amy, um, or myself, just, uh, type in the, the chat and we will get to them. And, uh, yeah, just, you made some good points. Uh, so when I was dealing with Graves disease, I was diagnosed with Graves in tw um, two, 2008. And, you know, I, at that point I knew stress was a factor, but I honestly didn't think my adrenals were too bad. So I, I was one that needed validation to, to get the testing. But I will say this, you can't always go by symptoms because when look, you know, like some listening might say, well, you know, I'm fatigued all day. So I, I know my adrenals are low. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes someone will be fatigued. They might have an ele you know, elevated cortisol levels. In my situation, I didn't feel fatigued, yet everything was low. Like So I had low cortisol, uh, low morning cortisol, low DHEA. I mean, pretty much everything was low on the test. And I felt fine. And, and probably a big part of that is because with hyperthyroidism, you get the increased metabolism. So that was offsetting it to some extent. Uh, but yeah, so I, if I had to guess before that, I would have guessed that either my adrenals were normal, because again, I, I, I was in denial, or I would have said if, if they were out of balance, I would have guessed they might have been on the higher side. I would have never have guessed it would have been low. And, you know, that could, to some extent, dictate the treatment. You know, obviously, you could, regardless of whether or not you do adrenal testing, you could eat well, you could do meditation, yoga. So it's not like you can't do anything, but you know, for a certain adrenal patterns, you might want to, you know, tr in my case, like, again, my adrenals were low. So I took licorice root to help with the uh, lower cortisol and, 
you know, and you know, so so again, like if someone has elevated cortisol, they might take like phosphatidylserine. You might have other, you know, um, other suggestions, but and those are just some general, not general, but general, I guess, based on the pattern. So not every, um, licorice root. I'll say if you have high blood pressure, you would not want to take it. So so I yeah. So be be careful with certain herbs and and supplements. But let's go ahead now and talk about perimenopause and you know so. You know, for I, those, I have one other question on testing before we oh, go. Yeah, on. Sure, Can you sure. walk us through what you would recommend screen? Because you're talking about screening is important, right? You can't always tell based on your symptoms. Like your mm -hmm. energy could be high or low for so many different reasons. So the screening and looking at these different pieces and figuring out, okay, which of these is the biggest factor for this person? Um, what what do you recommend for thyroid screening? Yeah, so um, so thyroid, you know, definitely, of course, TSH, the, our, our friend, thyroid stimulating hormone, which, you know, probably is one of the least important. I mean, I still pay attention to it, but a lot of doctors, that's all they do is TSH. Um, so TSH, you know, I like looking at the free hormones, free T3, free T4. Um, if someone wants to do a full panel where they're looking also at total T4, total T3, you know, that's fine too. But usually I, I stick with TSH, free T3, free T4, you know, thyroid antibodies. Uh, so, and it depends, it also depends on the presentation of the person. If, uh, if someone comes in, you know, what, what, what I'm suspecting to be Hashimoto's, usually it'll be like anti-thyroid globulin antibodies and thyroid peroxidase antibodies. You know, if they have Graves, the, the antibody specific for Graves are TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, which is a type of TSH receptor antibody. Um, there's also reverse T3 and reverse T3. I, that could also play a role like in conversion. A lot of times you'll see like reverse T3 high if someone has a problem converting T4, T3. The only thing is in hyperthyroidism, I used to do it on all my patients, but in hyperthyroidism, most people have the high, have everything high, like including reverse T3. So I usually don't recommend it anymore for my hyperthyroid patients. And I mean, from a thyroid perspective, I guess that's, yeah, I mean, that's what I, right. And then of course the, you know, the basics like CBC with differential and all, you know, but you know, you just ask really with thyroid, but there's, you know, other blood tests and, um, but yeah, uh, do you have any, are those what you do or do you do? Okay. I don't yeah, know. That's what I do. And the, and the reverse T3, that's interesting to make that point that, that you just did. I, I usually, do like to look at it at least on a first layer screening because more often the people that I'm interacting with are, are tired and fatigued and I'm worried about that conversion or if the adrenals or the gut or the liver are playing into that. Um, but, but it makes a lot of sense if someone is hyper, they're just going to be high across the board. You're not really looking at conversion in that instance. It's more just right. like everything's, everything's just high for the T3, T4, reverse T3, all of it. So, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Yep. Yeah. All right. So why don't you talk about perimenopause? So how does, you know, what's the difference between menopause and perimenopause? Yeah, good, good, good. So the, the, um, the technical definition of menopause is when it has been a full year since your last period. So it's defined that way because in the, in the time leading up to menopause, sometimes women will go a long time in between the periods, but then it'll still come. It'll be, instead of a month, it'll be two or three months or five or six months even. And then it might stretch out to like seven or eight months in between periods. But once you've gone a full year, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to get another period again after that. Like that's long enough to say like, yep, your body is done with having periods. So that's it. It's a defining moment. It's a single day. It's been exactly a year since you had a period. Um, I always re like to joke and recommend like throw yourself a pair, uh, uh, throw yourself a menopause party <laughs> on that day. It's been a year. Um, mm. And then after that day is technically referred to as post menopause. And then what we're talking about, especially today, uh, here today, is the whole transitional period leading up to the actual moment of menopause when, when it's been a year since that last period. So there's a whole uh, stage of life of transition. And I like to give the visual of thinking about your menstruating years as a bell curve. So when you have puberty, it, when you're in puberty, when you're a young, young, young teen, unfortunately it's happening earlier and earlier these days, but like usually young teen first period to start the menstruating years. 
and there's like there's an on ramp and we call that puberty <laughs> and that's that's the whole teenage time frame of of you know body changes and moodiness and questioning who you who who am i really anyway and like kind of kind of refiguring your life and like feeling awkward and you know having these changes going on and then and then as we get into the 20s and 30s there's more stability more like the top of that bell curve, like you, you for most women, right? There's every, there's all always uh, exceptions, but just in the the normal curve of things, is you know pretty regular cycles, and usually this is the more fertile years, and um, and just more more stability and regularity in the mens menstrual cycle, and then there's the downside of the bell curve as we as we taper down. It's basically what I like to. Uh, to help people think about perimenopause, it's like puberty in reverse. So it's kind of, it's a very similar experience where like your body's changing and things are going on and you might be feeling moody and all those kinds of things. But the beauty of perimenopause is that you're you're older and wiser and hopefully have more, you know, more resourced in, in your life and in your experience and in connections and how you can get help if you need it too. So um, it's, it's a, it's not a disease. It's not, a, a, you know, something that needs to be overly medicalized. Um, but it's a natural life transition and it can be a little ambiguous to define as, as puberty can be too. Like when, at what age does puberty end? You know, it's there, there's no real exact no notion to that. Um, so when does perimenopause begin is, is a little loose like that. Also, there's like, as soon as there's some shifts or changes or, or things that just like aren't as stable as they had been before, that's probably the beginning of perimenopause. And it can last five up to 10 even years. Um, so it doesn't mean that like you're, you know, you're going to be menopausal in, in any moment here. It's just, it's a phase. It's a transitional time. Um, and there's a lot that you can do to help support the the journey through it all. So, okay. And there's there's no so there's no specific test for perimenopause. There's there's not an exact test for saying that perimenopause has begun. That's um, there. We can start to see um, FSH and LH start to rise, but it's not mm -hmm. it's not a direct trajectory. So when you're in your menstruating years, usually LH and FSH will be lower when you're post-menopause will be higher, but there's not a direct line. Um, in perimenopause, it can be all over the place. So you could be high one month, low another month. And, it, and so it's not, it's not an accurate way to, to assess. And your estrogen and progesterone levels can be changing, but again, there's no, like no number of high or low because they're, they're changing. Um, so yes, there's no exact test that defines you as perimenopause. Okay, so what's the most important thing for a woman to do to help herself have a smooth transition through perimenopause? Yeah, so that's that's the the first half of our conversation. Really, is the answer to that question. Really, yeah. doing that stabilizing that foundation, and that's that addressing the stress, boosting the adrenal resiliency, so that that stress isn't having such a big impact. Getting your nutrition on board, your blood sugar regulated, your thyroid, you know, really functioning well. Um, all, all of that builds this foundation that makes it a much smoother ride. There may still be some ups and downs, but I like to joke that without any of that support in place, perimenopause can be like the thrill seeker roller coaster. <laughs> That's like, woo, you know, up and down and like scary and, and you know, really intense. Um, but we, with that stable foundation, we can put you on like the little kitty roller coaster. It's just, there may still be some ups and downs, but you can, you can, you know, ride with it and kind of, kind of have a good time with it. So, um, so that's, that's, yeah, building that foundation and really, um, I, I've seen they all of those factors are important and I've just seen again and again that the adrenals and the stress that underlies all of those are, is so much of what makes the difference. And yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Very good. Well, I definitely want to you know, leave some time for questions, but and then we'll also talk about your quiz. Dr. Amy has a quiz that she'd like to share. But is there anything else you'd like to to add or? Um, 
I think I think just the the point I feel like when we talk about stress and the fact that stress can lead to all these other issues that um, I just want to be careful to to say that it's it's not that you have to completely remove yourself from stress or like from your life and in order to be healthy i think there that it can be um easy to to go into the extreme of like oh well i have to you know completely change everything and stop doing all these things and all that in order to get stress down i really see it more as how to build your resiliency and how to help your your body and your physiology be able to be healthy in an environment that has stress going on in it um, because a lot of the women that i work with are are um you know leaders entrepreneurs business owners or have projects that they're working on they have their families that they're that they're supporting and and everything and it just there's there's um I think it's really important that women can do the things that they want to do and have their impact and do their do make their difference. Um, and it's important to have your health supporting you to be able to do all those things too. And it's and that 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 is possible. And that I I've been through it myself up and down where I like you know get so into something and then I get sick and adrenal fatigued or whatever and I have to like build back up again and then that so so I've learned in that process of figuring out the things that help to keep that stability in place while being able to continue pursuing your passions and doing the things that you want to do and having your health really making it all possible instead of your health suffering because of all the things that you're doing so just wanted to make that point. It's stress can be a good thing. It's about mm -hmm. how we, the skills you mentioned before are our, our, our stress supporting skills and um, how, how are we help our physiology to be able to um, roll with the things that go on in life. So that's fine. All right. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for adding that. And so I am going to put the link to the quiz, but I'd like you to talk about the quiz. So people, you know, when they see, you know, what, what, why should people go ahead and and take your quiz. I mean, I'm going to recommend definitely, definitely take the quiz, but let's, yeah. 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 So the, the quiz, it's called the, why am I so tired <laughs> quiz? And it's, this is something that I just hear from, from so many um, women and just get being able to get a better understanding about what factors are at play and, and why that, that, uh, why you're feeling so tired all the time and what, what could be going on um, that's going to help you. And that, that idea that's, that stress is inevitable, but if you're feeling depleted, you're feeling run down, you're, you're feeling the, the effects of that chronic stress build up, like, why is it that that's happening? Um, and after you take the quiz, then we'll talk more also about how to build your resiliency and, um, how to, how to help to, uh, to, get you to a place where you're having more energy too for all the things that you're doing. So when you take the quiz, um, you'll get your resiliency score. So you're going to find out how your adrenals are doing and it's just how much of a factor stress is being for you in your particular case. Um, and we'll uh, get, uh, give you some tips on getting started boosting your energy. And I also am going to be teaching a, uh, a workshop later this month called From Fatigued to Fired Up. And I'm going to be teaching some some surprising strategies in there about the kinds of things that can make the difference to um, to really help make a shift and help to build your resiliency and boost your energy and uh, and help you uh, to to be able to make your difference and really enjoy your life and do the things that you want to do, but have your health really supporting you in doing that. So um, start with a quiz and and find out why am I so tired and uh, and. I hope that will be very helpful for you. So great. So then, when they uh, when they complete the quiz, they'll get information on that master class if they want to sign up. Is that correct? Because I get yeah. also okay. Yeah. When you complete the quiz, you'll get your number. There's a little learn more, and when you click on that, you'll get some some tips and information of understanding that. And at the bottom of that page, there's a button right there to sign up for the class. Um, and then, yeah, go through and actually sign up for the class and we'll make sure that you get your free access to that. Um, and if you if you miss it on that, we'll send you a follow up email to, to make sure that you know when that class is coming. It's a few weeks from now, but you, you can reserve your spot now and um, we'll send you reminders as it gets closer too. so. All right. All right. Wonderful. So uh, 
So yeah, I have it on the screen here. I put it in the chat. Now it's all, it's not gonna go into the Facebook group. So I'll have to do that manually, which I'll do that just cause it's a private group. So it goes, it should, it, I'm thinking it's just going to the page right now, but I also been displaying it for the last minute or two here. And I'll make sure that I'll manually put it in the groups. Yeah. Uh, and um, all right. So listening and didn't see that typed. It's just, it's replenishyourenergy.com slash quiz. Okay. So replenishyourenergy.com slash quiz. All right, cool. Thanks for verbally letting everyone know. So yeah, definitely sign up for that quiz and uh, as well as the masterclass as well, which will, again, the masterclass will be later this month. And, uh, but the, the quiz you could do right away or maybe maybe in a few minutes after, after we answer questions. So, um, but um, all right, so let's get to, so, so stay in your lane. Hello, Dr. E and Dr. A. Happy Friday. Thanks for sharing. You are welcome. Thanks for attending. And then happy to be here. Yeah, we got someone from Facebook watching. Yeah, that's the only downside of StreamYard is if they don't get permission, then their name doesn't display. So that means they're in the group if it comes up as Facebook user. And so I've been I've been the reverse curve for all my adult life. And I was told it was because of my low blood pressure, 120 over 60. I developed Graves five years ago and it got down to five milligrams um, after beginning toxics. So, uh, okay, are you, are you talking about the, the medication five milligrams? Cause I know a lot of patients take methimazole and five milligrams would be like a low dose. Cause yeah, I don't think a blood pressure of like 120 over five, that would be like pretty low. <laughs> uh, <I'm guessing. laughs> I think saying that they probably started treatment five years ago. They've had improvement. They've gotten the medication down. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> yeah. cracking an unfunny joke here. So, so what, what would I do to improve the cortisol? Um, well, you know, I'll, I'll let you, I could always add, but you know, let's, let's hear from yeah, you. I'll, I'll, one thing that, that strikes me is I just want to, want to, like question and kind of reverse the um, the cause and effect or the chicken and egg um, part of your your first comment of having that reserve cur reverse curve and saying that was because of low blood pressure. I would actually say that more than likely the imbalanced adrenal function is contributing to your low blood pressure. So the adrenals, I, I mentioned early on, they produce a host of hormones. Cortisol is a big one we talk about that has to do with the stress response, DHEA, another important cortisol hormone. They can produce estrogen and progesterone we talked about. And another hormone that the adrenals are responsible for producing is one called aldosterone, which is um, more to do with regulating your fluid and electrolytes and regulating the kidneys. So remember the adrenals are actually located on top of the kidneys and there's a reason for that um, because they they actually do uh, regulate the mechanisms of the of kidney filtration and when the adrenals are not functioning properly we can tend to lose our electrolytes more easily through the through the urine um, and that can cause us to feel low blood pressure because we don't have that salt and that the electrolytes in the bloodstream to hold the fluid in um, then we can be low blood pressure. And a lot of people with adrenal dysfunction have low blood pressure, feel like you get dizzy. You know, if you stand up too quick, you kind of get dizzy or faint easily. Um, so really supporting, I'd say one of the um, first things if you're having low blood pressure and you're needing to support your adrenals would be to make sure you're getting plenty of electrolytes in. Um, I, I, one thing that I recommend for people is start your day, as long as you don't have high blood pressure and need to, you know, need to watch your salt intake, start your day with a glass of water with some salt in it. Um, it's a really nice way to start your day and, um, and a little squeeze of lemon if you're inclined to that. Um, but the salt or the electrolytes first thing in the morning help to, to get the adrenals going and help to make sure that your body has, um, has that support for the blood pressure. So electrolytes can make a really big difference and lots of other things that help to stabilize and, and flip that curve back to being high in the morning, low at night. There's, there's a lot to that. Um, but one of the first things when I hear that blood pressure piece would be electrolytes. Yeah, and you would recommend like natural sea salt, for example, or yeah, so either the you know natural sea salt, Celtic salt, Himalayan salt, and any of the good quality salts that have some minerals with them too. 
Um, and in terms of the amount, it, it varies to taste. So usually when this is going on, people will also actually crave salt too. So if you do, the person who wrote this in, if you also notice yourself having cravings for salt through the day, then this would be probably really good for you to do that you put salt to taste. So it should still taste good. It should be like refreshing. Um, if you feel like you're drinking ocean water and it's disgusting, then cut the amount of salt back. And what usually happens over the course of a few months is the same amount of salt that you were craving and wanting suddenly starts tasting too salty and you can decrease the amount that you're including in your morning water. All right. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Amy. And let's, uh, so we're going to go another ten the improvement so far with the graves, like just to, you know, be able to get down to that really low dose and it's, it's good, good progress. You're moving in the right direction. And I think addressing the adrenals next could probably be really helpful for you. Yeah, no, that is true. Five milligrams, low dose, obviously, once it gets to the point where you don't need the methimazole, but, um, but yeah, you know, one step at a time. And, uh, and yeah, no, the, what have other things that you've seen, uh, Dr. Eric, that have made the difference for someone to get off that last little bit that to get them to the place where they really don't need it? Yeah, probably too much to discuss uh, here, but because, uh, you know, it's not just adrenals. I mean, adrenals, are, you know, do play an important role. And, you know, like I said, I had a low cortisol pattern in the morning. I, I didn't have a reverse curve, meaning my, my cortisol wasn't high at night, but I, I had low morning cortisol. And of course, diet, lifestyle factors played a big role. And then, you know, other things I mentioned, the licorice root in my case, which again, I can't, we can't give specific recommendations here, even though you have low blood pressure, you might be fine with that. But, but again, in my case, that helped out, you know, B vitamins, vitamin C, you know, just nutrients. I mean, nutrients overall, obviously important, but, but there could be other things, of course, dragging down adrenals as well. That, I mean, there could be stealth infections. Uh, and again, not saying that's the case with, with the person just asked the question, but, um, but I definitely would follow the advice of, you know, Dr. A or suggestions that Dr. Amy gave and, you know, but try to do everything you can diet lifestyle. Um, but yeah, so, sometimes uh, actually a good number of times we do have to dig deeper you know, if diet and li especially if diet and lifestyle isn't enough, if you've been dealing with it for a long time, then you might have to dig deeper. Could be, again, like I said, infections, it could be toxic mold, it could be, you know, chemicals, um, environmental toxins. But, um, but yeah, good job so far getting down to the five milligrams. And, uh, you know, just, again, if the adrenals are still good news, if adrenals are still a problem, that I mean, that's not a pr good news. But but again, maybe just by improving the adrenal health itself, you might not need to dig deeper. You might have the answer. But but again, the problem is also what's causing the adrenal. Is it just? I mean, as Dr. Amy said, it's not always just emotional stress because we all, and we all deal with stressors. You know, a, a lot of a lot of times we could just do things to improve our perception of stress. And again, um, blocking out time for you know stress management, mind body medicine. But as I mentioned, sometimes we do need to dig deeper. All right, we got Claire. Thanks for joining Claire. And um, Claire, love the concepts of puberty in reverse. Cool, cool, cool. All right, and then I could answer this. Uh, have hyperthyroidism, is it good for me to go for surgery? So again, can't give specific recommendations. All I could say is that sometimes surgery is necessary. I can't say it's never necessary, but in most cases, it should be the last resort. So it really depends. You know, if someone has, you know, thyroid cancer, for example, that might be a situation when surgery is necessary. If someone has Graves' disease, but the, you know, uh, the endocrinologist is pressuring them to get surgery, you know, my goal is to try to, you know, work with people to try, just like I did when I had Graves, I could have opted for radioactive iodine or thyroid surgery. And uh, so I chose to address the cause of the problem. So, so every, everyone is, is different and, you know, there are, there's a time and place, but the, my goal is to try to minimize um, people getting the conventional medical treatment, at least with radioactive iodine thyroid surgery. A lot of my patients do take the anti-thyroid medication to be safe. Some take an herbal approach, but that's completely different I topic. I to say that I think it's so awesome, Dr. Eric, that you offer what you do because the person who just wrote in, probably her, their endocrinologist has only offered 
surgery, right? Or, or, or very few options. And I just think it's really, it's so great that, that you're here and that you're asking this question and looking into this because um, I, I think it's really, uh, really important that in our journey of healthcare and healing, that we have access to options and that you're presented with like, well, you can go this route or you can go this route. And here's these, these different ways about this. And, um, you know, there's a time and a place, but um, Dr. Eric has a lot of really great resources and an amazing approach to giving you another option that you don't have to go for surgery necessarily. Like it's, it's one of the options. So. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Dr. Amy. Yeah. I mean, my goal is to try to save people's thyroid. It's, it's thyroid gland, you know, the thyroid gland, it's not always possible, but, um, but again, yeah, too many times the endocrinologist will say someone needs to receive radioactive iodine thyroid surgery and that, Again, sometimes that that is the option. That is, you know, the best option. But many times that's not the case. And um, and we have a thank you here. So you are welcome. Thanks for tuning in. And then Melissa here. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning. What kind of doctor do I need to see to get my adrenals tested? I've always had a fight or flight state of re um, reactant situations and battled graves on and off for the last six years. I know stress is a trigger, but never been tested or try to cope with stress aside from yoga, meditation, lemon balm, motherwort, and CBD at night. So, um, so what kind of doctor? Obviously, you know, doctor, you know, both doctor and Amy and I, we help people with adrenal problems. So, uh, but I'll I'll let you uh, expand on. Yeah, who would be? Sure. So, yeah. so, I mean, the, it's, it's, you're, you're right to ask the question because not every doctor tends to offer testing for adrenals the way that we're talking about, really looking at that pattern over the day and looking at it more holistically. So it's going to be, I'm, I'm a naturopathic doctor, Dr. Eric's chiropractor. So an integrative functional medicine, um, more natural, holistic kind of practitioner is who is going to be able to help you with that. Um, and I, I'll mention we, we do have a, um, an online group program that we run uh, where we actually give you access and to show you exactly how to order your own adrenal saliva test and really get into the details of understanding what your results mean and what kinds of things to do to focus on um, to, to improve your adrenal function too. Um, so that's, that is something that we teach in our group program, which would be a, a, an easier to access, lower cost kind of way of getting help. Um, or, of, of course, in a, the private practice of either either one of us or, or a functional um, integrative naturopathic holistic <laughs> alternative, et cetera, kind of um, practitioner would be able to help you with that, too. So, All right. No. Yeah. And I, I will also add that probably the person who's not going to treat your adrenals would be your primary care doctor or your endocrinologist. Unfortunately, they usually, they might run a morning cortisol, maybe look at DHEA, but they're usually not going to look at the circadian rhythm of cortisol through the saliva, through dried urine testing. So, um, so yeah, Dr. Amy is right. And um, yeah, and, and again, make sure you, not only the, the quiz, but her masterclass as well to sign up for the master class because that's going to also I, I don't know if it you might not talk about testing and all that but you'll but it is going to focus on adrenals correct the, or um, yeah. it focuses on adrenals and, and how then strategies to to help and yeah and it's it's different kinds of strategies it's not just eat eat your you know eat your protein and go to bed at night there's more to it than that so um yes happy to happy to share more with you and all right. Well, let's try to get to a few more questions. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but um, but Pilly here is it is it recommendable to use the natural clock during perimenopause for those who are uh, those of us who no longer want to take the pill? Um, will the body temperature readings be too unreliable? So I'll let you take this one. <laughs> I can take that. So I'm pretty sure what you're referring to is for the sake of contraception. Um, so. That so during perimenopause, even though your cycles are irregular, you you still can get pregnant. So being being careful to prevent pregnancy if you're not wanting to get pregnant is important to do. Um, and taking temperature readings is one way of the um, like natural family planning of like noticing your temperature regulations and using that information to know when you're ovulating and when you're fertile and then when you're not. Um, but in perimenopause, it, it, you're right to be concerned about that. It becomes more unreliable because the cycle length can change and it's, it's a lot harder to, to be sure of what your pattern is going to be in which days you're more or less fertile. 
Um, and and it's it's already a low of less reliable method than some other forms of contraception. So if you're wanting to avoid pregnancy, I would be um, I would be careful about relying on the temperature reading. So, but regulating your cycle, the, doing the things about stabilizing that foundation, whether that's through adrenal support and then thyroid, blood sugar, getting your nutrition, your sleep patterns, all of that can help to restore a more normal cycle, which can you know be a more dependable pattern also. So um, hopefully that helps. All right. Um, do you have time for a couple of more questions or do you? I, I could, yes. Okay. Maybe one of questions. I'm happy to help. So. Okay. Um, and we, yeah, so let's, because this I know someone asked in the Facebook group, um, can perimenopause hormones trigger hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism? Do you want to cover it? Do you want me to talk about it? Uh, you, you take that one. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, I mentioned earlier, stress definitely could be a factor and, and potentially a trigger, you know, of, uh, you know, Graves, Hashimoto's. And, you know, I mentioned how chronic stress could affect the conversion of T4, T3. And, and that could, you know, so that could lead to low T3, which is uh, the active form of thyroid hormone. You know, as far as peri, I mean, the sex hormones, I, I hate to say like I, my, my, so the short answer I think would be no, in my opinion, like they're not really a trigger. I mean, you know, women have been undergoing perimenopause for quite a long time. And, you know, I, I think uh, we do see hormone fluctuate, uh, like a relationship sometimes between hormone fluctuations and, you know, thyroid conditions like um, postpartum thyroiditis, you know, is, is, is common. But even that, I don't look at that as really the postpartum, th I don't look at the birth process being a trigger. You know, the most, most women have had, you know, had the antibodies well before, you know, for Hashimoto. So I think the same thing, you know, it's not going to cause the development of, you know, in the case, it's not going to, I haven't seen it where it causes directly causes hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism. But for those with Graves, Hashimoto's, you might wonder, is it a trigger? And it, it might be, you know, it might be a factor, but it's mo most people or just about everybody will have had the autoantibodies for those conditions develop well before perimenopause. And so to me, it's, it's not, I, I don't, I don't consider it an actual trigger. Yeah. I, I agree. I'd say it's a time in life where it often shows up and it gets discovered, but it's not necessarily that the perimenopause is what triggered it. They probably never got screened beforehand or, or, or the stress of going through perimenopause is, is more so the trigger than the perimenopause itself, for example, or other things going on. So I, I would say I see um, I see a lot of women while their hormones are changing, it's a time where you can have changes in your thyroid or discover those changes too. But it is with the case of the antibodies, it's very likely that they've actually been around for longer and you just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. right. not every woman who goes through perimenopause gets triggered into a thyroid problem. So it's not, it's not a direct thing, but it can compound and kind of come together. So. Yeah, you know, it could be a contributing factor. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and again, there's a lot of, you know, the stress, I think, is really big, what we spoke about earlier, not not just the, the hormones, you know, perimenopause, menopause, but, um, but let's see, we got Shirley here. Um, that would be me, I guess, something you mentioned earlier. Um, and then here we have Tracy, um, Dr. Amy and Dr. Eric, this is Tracy from New York. My saliva test results on Tuesday, um, 10 a.m., 0.34. Um, two, uh, yeah, so pretty much he gave her thyroid. Um, this looks like cortisol, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's the four, four different cortisol. The, um, so, yeah, our first one she didn't take until 10 a.m. And then um, and two third, and, and again, uh, you might have not woken. She might have not woken up until around that time. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, to, and yeah, I don't know if this is saliva. Oh, yeah, actually, she says saliva test results here. I was going to say um, the units are different from the testing that I'm used to seeing. I'm probably the same with you, but everything, you know, other than that first one, obviously the first one is hot, the highest, which is what you, you know. That's the good news. It is the highest. The other ones are 
kind of on the lower side, that third and fourth one undetectable. And um, yeah, so it looks like, on, uh, you know, and I, I don't know what the range would be for that first one. It depends on the lab. So that also might very well might be on the low side. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely the other values are, are all on the, the lower side. That's, yeah, so I'm not sure what, um, what lab, but yeah, do you have any, any feedback? Uh, it's Pretty similar to what you're saying. I mean, different labs have different reference ranges. So I would just say, look at your results in the normal range. A lot of labs report with a graphic too. Like you can see the, the zone on, on a graphic of what would normal be and where, and then you look at your line compared to that. Um, but you're like Dr. Erica was saying, the pattern is correct. You're highest and then down and then down. So you're not doing a reverse. Um, but I, 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 the later numbers for sure. And maybe even that first one are probably low. So it's more of a, more of that depleted, like needing to do a lot of restoration to, to help build back up again. But it's good that you're not getting that, like that burst of, of second wind backwards thing at the end of the night. Um, but all right, thank you. Can you do two more? If you if you really have to go, I'll let you go. Yeah, no, I, can, I can do two more. I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep, I'm up to five more minutes. So let's. If uh, you okay. So, well, let's do four because I want to also give a minute to wrap up and also give your. So we'll do like four. Um, we'll we'll do like maybe a couple of yeah. So we'll definitely get you off by four minutes. So can your adrenals cause um, can your adrenals cause pain in that area? That's an interesting question. I not commonly, um, but I have had some patients who are just really sensitive and really tuned into their bodies and like feel like they have some sensation um, around that. But it's not typical at all. Usually, it's not something that you're you're palpably feeling in your body um, right in that area. But it's 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 possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. It's not something that's common, but but yeah, it's. Uh... Mm -hmm. Your body is talking to you in some way, right? Yeah. But if you're hurting in that area, I think it's important to consider what else could be causing that pain. Is it your like kidney? Yeah, uh, exactly. Muscle strain or something going on with your back. But right. yeah. All right. And then this one, this might be the last one because it's a long question. So let's see. I was recently diagnosed with Graves. I've been one month on Amy Myers protocol, no gluten, dairy, nightshades, eggs daily curcumin, fish oil, zinc, vitamin D, probiotic, along with 10 milligrams of methimazole, propranolol, my T3, T4, are back to normal, my, um, my what has LFT gone? liver function test. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. Liver function test had gone up. I want to stop methimazole. Someone recommended herbal control. My symptoms. Do you have any recommendations? Um, okay. So, so you're on 10 milligrams of methimazole. And the liver function, so like AST, ALT have gone up. Um, probably and a good maybe due to the methimazole and someone, yeah. So, so I could cover this. I mean, I again can't give specific recommendations. When I was dealing with Graves, uh, you know, I I did take bugleweed. I did not take the antithyroid medication. I mentioned earlier how a lot of my patients do take antithyroid medication, such as methimazole or sometimes PTU or carbimazole if you live overseas, but. Um, yeah, so I took bugleweed and so that, again, I can't tell someone to take bugleweed. I mean, my patients, I could talk to them about it, but, but again, I took bugleweed and that did a pretty good job with me. The good news is 10 milligrams is still on that low side of them is all. Um, so you might be okay. Uh, you know, you just, I mean, I will have some patients take methimazole and the bugleweed at the same time, usually not exactly at the same time, but you know, maybe like an hour or so apart. And, you know, again, I can't tell them to, to, to stop taking the bethimazole, as I mentioned, but, you know, I, I, I took, uh, when I was dealing with Graves, I took uh, five milliliters twice a day of uh, one to two extract of bugleweed. But again, that was my personal situation and I based it on the thyroid blood test. And then there's herbs such as motherwort. Motherwort is more for the symptoms, not really affecting the um, the thyroid. So like propranolol is a beta blocker. So there's something like I, I took, I took bugleweed and I took motherwort. Um, I actually started with bugleweed, but still had some heart palpitation. So, so instead of taking a beta blocker, essentially I took the motherwort and, um, but you want to be careful just about abruptly stop stopping anything. And, um, 
All right, so let's, I say let's wrap it up just because it's uh, it's pretty close and uh, don't want to, you know, again, I've already kept you longer than, than I promised. So, you know, just there's so many questions and I hate leaving them unanswered, but again, it's, 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 you know, well, uh, yeah, just, um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, register for the masterclass, uh, and, uh, and let me put up the one more time that replenish your energy. And again, I apologize for those who, that we didn't get to your questions, but, um, but again, thanks for attending. And if any questions specific for hyperthyroidism or Hashimoto's, again, I, I'll, I do these on a regular basis, not necessarily every single week, even though I think I will be next week. So, so um, stay tuned, the, you know, you'll, but, um, and then again, you know, Dr. Amy, you know, by visiting her quiz, you'll be on her list as well. And you'll, you know, get access to her masterclass. So if you have more questions on adrenals, perimenopause, again, definitely fill out the quiz, attend the masterclass. Um, but again, Dr. Amy, I'd like to thank you again for, you know, not only the interview, but again, going over to make sure we get to some of the questions. Again, not all of them, but again, we got to a good, good, good number of them. And appreciate you, you, um, you doing that and sharing. Uh, you know, sharing your thoughts and feedback on adrenal health and perimenopause. Thank you so much for having me. It's really fun and happy to answer questions. And we'll do more Q&A at the end of the masterclass too. So, so check the quiz and um, hope to stay in touch. And thank you, Dr. Eric, again, for the important work that you do and offering this, these options in between the nothing or the dr dramatic, um, really important uh, work and so great that people have options when it comes to their graves and their hashis. And um, thank you for having me here today. All right. No, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. And maybe we'll do it again in the future. And uh, again, everyone have a wonderful day, a wonderful rest of your weekend. And same to you, Dr. Amy, have an awesome rest of your Friday and weekend as well. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.